you know, lefty, we know he's a great hitter. He was, uh, he had, like many of us, a lot of contradictions. Um, first of all, he always was considered to be Irish, yet he was half German and only a quarter Irish and a quarter French Italian. He played a male dominated sport, but his first coach was a woman. He uh, was a scientific hitter, yet he was extremely superstitious. He used to actually label his, uh, his favorite bats with a, a lightning bolt and used to throw his glove down on the field, and if the uh, fingers pointed in a certain direction, he knew that meant he was going to get a hit. Um, so he was a very colorful character, very interesting character. I'm going to kind of take you through his life a little bit um, and really emphasize Japan, which I think is his real legacy and something that has been most appreciated probably in the last 15 to 20 years. Of course, besides being a great hitter, we know that he was a great hitting instructor, and these are some of the people that he influenced. And Joe DiMaggio on the top left and his brother Dom next to him. Joe was pretty much a finished product by the time uh, Lefty got to him uh, in 1935. He'd already played a couple of seasons with the Seals. His job was really, uh, Lefty had just retired from the New York Giants. His job was to get uh, Joe ready for Major League Baseball in, in New York and understand what it was like to uh, deal with the press there. Uh, Ted Williams. Um, Ted used a Lefty O'Doul model bat the year he hit 406. It had Ted's name on the barrel, but um, I was able to check with the Louisville Slugger uh, archives, and, and uh, it was a, he, he always idolized Lefty. It was, Ted signed as a high school junior with the San Diego Padres, who actually outbid the Yankees and the Cardinals for his services. Um, and uh, he went to Lefty for advice, and Lefty basically told, famously told him, kid, don't change a thing. And he said that uh, he was going to heed that advice, and if anything ever happened with his swing, he'd go back to Lefty and get help. Um, the far right, there is Ferris Fain, who's reaching up. He won two batting titles in the American League in the 1950s. Um, he always had famous stories about uh, Lefty having techniques of teaching, hitting. One of the things that was Lefty's tenants was not to lunge. And so he would put a rope uh, around uh, the belt loops, and Fain would talk about every time he'd start to swing, he'd find himself in the back of the batting cage because he'd lunged again. Bottom left is Gene Woodling. Uh, lefty really re uh, revived his career. He, he was about out of baseball. Uh, lefty took, took him on. He had 385 for the Seals and then went on to uh, play for the New, uh, New York Yankees and have quite a successful career and credited O'Doul with his success. You might wonder why there's a picture of Lefty with Gary Cooper. Well, he also did hitting instructing in the movies, and he helped Gary Cooper play the role of Lou Gehrig in Pride of the Yankees, which this year is the 75th anniversary, and there's a book actually out on that movie that talks about Lefty's role in that. But Lefty started out as a pitcher and ended up being a great hitter, talking about contradictions. And, but he still knew enough about pitching. He was also a great pitching instructor, and Ryan Duran, uh, on the bottom there, uh, the next to last uh, on the bottom right. He uh, was basically washed out. That's a picture of him with the Vancouver Mounties. And uh, Lefty revived his career, and, and to the end of his life, Ryan credited uh, Lefty with saving his career. And then Larry Jansen on the lower right. Larry Jansen won uh, 30 games for the Seals in 1946 and went to the majors and was a 20-game winner as a rookie. And he credited Lefty with his success as well, especially the, uh, the mental part of the game. Then it was kids. Lefty was always about kids, and these are some, some uh, interesting photos from his time. The top left is him with the New York Giants. He'd just been traded from the Brooklyn uh, Dodgers, and this is a youth team he had sponsored out of his own pocket in Brooklyn that had come to honor him uh, at the polo grounds. The bottom left is uh, right after the 1933 World Series, he came back to San Francisco, and most of these kids are from his old neighborhood. He was born in Butchertown, which is Bayview Hunters Point now, and never really forgot where he came from. And he'd hold these kids' days, starting in 1927, where all the kids would get into games for free, and he'd hand out bats and balls and things like that all the way uh, through into the 1940s. And he was always popular with the kids. These are a lot of the kids from his old neighborhood. Along the other uh, man in there on his left, on the, to the left of the photo is Joe Cronin, uh, those were the two stars from the 1933 World Series. 
Um, the upper right is a scene with him with the seals signing autographs as he was wont to do. And the bottom right is an interesting photo. It's actually from 1970. It's a year after Lefty's death. This is in Vancouver. And he was only in Vancouver for one year as a manager. Yet he sponsored a team out of his own pocket there as well. And this is a, a young man showing up in an O'Doul's Angels uniform. And uh, this is a, a memorial that was done for uh, Lefty uh, in his memory in 1970, in the, uh, about two months after his death. You can see his picture up there on the wall. So, uh, and then of course as a manager, and he managed in uh, San Francisco and uh, for 17 years, most famously with the Seals, San Diego and Oakland. Uh, the bottom left, he's with Vancouver and Seattle, and then on the far right, he was a batting instructor for the San Francisco Giants when they first came west, um, and that's him with Hank Sauer. Lefty won 2000, over 2,000 games in the Pacific Coast League as a manager. That's the most of anyone in the Coast League. And he turned down several uh, options to manage in the major leagues, most famously with the New York Giants, uh, at least twice, the New York Yankees, Philadelphia Athletics in the 1950s, and the Phillies in 1943. Um, and I think a lot of it was he knew he could be his own man in San Francisco. He even said that, that he could manage his own way. Um, and he knew that wasn't going to be necessarily the case in the big leagues. And then Lefty was known for golf. And here he is on the left with Babe Ruth. This is uh, in November of 1933. This is uh, actually at a time when Lefty was uh, working to convince Babe Ruth to come to Japan for a big tour. And on the right, this is uh, Lefty in an obviously posed picture with a very determined young man. That young man is Tom Watson, who ended up becoming, of course, a Hall of Fame uh, golfer. And it's interesting, both of them really know how to work the camera there, because there's no way that's a real swing with Lefty that close. But uh, Lefty always looked natural with a camera. And those were some of his other passions. And of course, he was known for uh, his businesses, the Lefty O'Doul uh, uh, Bar and Restaurant. If you look at the facade, uh, one thing that's interesting to note is that the building that Lefty O'Doul uh, was in until recently um, opened in 1916 as a, as a movie theater. It was the first building built exclusively as a movie theater in the United States. Um, and it was called the Theater St. Francis, not to be confused with St. Francis Theater. Um, and then it went through different incarnations before Lefty took it over in 1958. Before that, he had another bar on Powell Street at 209 Powell Street in the upper left with the cable car. That's when he owned it. On the right, the color picture, he, he didn't own it anymore, but it still operated. It was still called Lefty's up until it closed in the early 1970s. And in the lower right is, again, another picture of, there was another Lefty O'Doul's, and that was in Vancouver. And it opened uh, the year after Lefty died. It was home of the uh, Vancouver Jazz Festival until 2012. So Lefty left an imprint uh, pretty much wherever he went. So Lefty, again, he started out as a pitcher. And uh, this is him with the Seals. Uh, he, he started out uh, with the... Son, Native Sons of the Golden West, they had uh, a baseball league that played on Sundays, and his success led the Seals to signing him. But almost from the beginning, there was debate over whether he should, he was such a good athlete and such a good hitter. He was usually the fastest guy on his team, had tremendous hand-to-eye coordination, but he liked pitching, and I think part of it was he liked the attention um, that it brought. There is nothing that's more center of attention than the pitcher in a game. And so you'll notice uh, there's a baseball card here of him in 1921 swinging a bat, even though he was a pitcher that year and won 25 games for the Seals, yet he's depicted as a hitter. He also hit 338 that season. But he had injured his arm. He went to the Yankees in 1919 and 1920 and barely played, probably appeared in 40 games over three years with the Yankees, and most of it was pinch hitting. Um, he maybe pitched a total of 20 or 30 innings was all, just never got off the bench. And he'd hurt his arm to the point where uh, Bob Stevens, the San Francisco uh, writer, sports writer, would famously say of Lefty, um, he could run like a deer. Unfortunately, he also threw like one. Um, and so the Yankees took note of that and, and uh, kept trying to get him to convert to the outfield, but he's rather stubborn. 
And so the man on the right, Harry Sparrow, he was convinced that, uh, that Lefty could be another Ty Cobb, and there were others that said the same thing. But Lefty, uh, and, and he said, you're only trading Lefty over my dead body. Uh, and about six months after this photo was taken, Harry Sparrow died of a heart attack, and they traded Lefty to the Red Sox. <laughs> So Lefty, went, uh, after the Red Sox, he actually set a pitching record that still, unfortunately, stands. He gave up 16 runs in one game as a relief pitcher, 13 of them in one inning. That pretty much uh, ended his pitching career. He went back to the Coast League and started out as a pitcher again in Salt Lake City, but the high altitude uh, cured him of the idea of pitching, and he became a hitter and was an almost instant success. Uh, in his second month as a regular player, he, he, for a month-long period, he came one hit short of hitting 500 for the month. He ended up hitting 392 in his first season. Um, and then the next season was hitting about 420 in mid-year when he got hit by uh, a pitch uh, on his elbow. He'd already gone six for six twice in three days. He'd had a stretch where he had 19 hits and 20 at-bats. Uh, just incredible. And the man on the left, William Wrigley, saw, that, saw him and said he owned the Los Angeles Angels as well as owning the Chicago Cubs. Uh, and he had a ticker tape installed at his home in, uh, on Avalon on Catalina Island where uh, he would get reports of how the Los Angeles Angels were doing that day. Um, so he said, I want a duel, I'll wrap him up, I'll take him. But he had a new manager with the Cubs in 1926, and that's Joe McCarthy, pictured here with Grover Cleveland Alexander. Uh, and Joe McCarthy didn't take to Lefty. Lefty, early in his career, Lefty really didn't take his career very seriously. He, he palled around with Babe Ruth. He palled around with Bob Musil. Um, he uh, got in trouble. One of the reasons that he says he was left on the mound to give up 13 runs in one inning is Frank Chance was mad at him because he'd gone out on the town and missed curfew with some of his old Yankees teammates. And um, he was playing golf and goofing off. And Joe McCarthy, his first major league managing job, he just didn't take that very well uh, and ended up cutting lefty in spring training. And Wrigley would always go around saying, uh, that's my O'Doul. You know, that's the only guy, this is the only player that Wrigley ever personally signed for the Chicago Cubs. And lefty would get his revenge. Uh, one thing that you would discover uh, is you didn't uh, give short shrift to Lefty O'Doul's talents. He would come back to haunt you. So he went back to the Coast League. And in 1927, he won the Most Valuable Player League uh, Award in the league. The picture on the right uh, is him with Lou Gehrig. And this is a postseason tour of uh, the Larrapin Lou's and the Bustin' Babes. Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig did a barnstorming tour after the 1927 season, came out to California. And Lefty played in a few of the games uh, with Babe's team. And this is uh, Lou Gehrig presenting him with the $1,000 check that he received for winning the Most Valuable Player Award in 1927. And that got him finally back to the majors. At age 31, he comes to the New York Giants. And here he's uh, pictured uh, with the Giants. The bottom picture is him uh, at opening day in Boston. Um, that's Les Bell on the left with Rogers Hornsby, um, Shanty Hogan, then O'Doul, and Andy Cohen. Andy Cohen was a player that John McGraw hoped he was a second baseman. John McGraw was looking for a star Jewish player um, so that they could have a drawing card that would compete with the, uh, the Yankees who'd kind of eclipse them as the, as the big draw, baseball draw in New York. Lefty was platoon that year by McGraw. He only played about four times against uh, left-handed pitching as McGraw uh, wasn't convinced he could hit left-handers. So uh, he did hit 318 that year and had a, had a good season. Uh, but at the end, uh, McGraw didn't like his defense and uh, they traded him to the Philadelphia Phillies. And this is where at age 32, Lefty O'Doul became an overnight sensation. So that life boy sign, that's uh, a, a wall encased in tin at the Baker Bowl in Philadelphia. And this uh, sign went up in 1929. Lefty got one look at that, and it's very close. It's less than 300 feet away. And he said, I knew I could knock a ball off that anytime I wanted to. And boy, he did that year. 
The Phillies uh, had come off the worst season any major league team had had in the last 30 years. Um, and they actually uh, finished in fifth place uh, and made a run at 500 that year. And part of it was lefty. He hit 398 that season, set a record that still stands for the National League with 254 hits in a season, also drew 76 walks, hit 32 home runs, and struck out only 19 times. I don't think you'd see that today. And the next year, he hit 383, and that's when he got his revenge against the Cubs. The Cubs had lost the 1929 World Series, and Wrigley wasn't real happy with the fact how they'd reacted to that. So, uh, and, and Wrigley was from Philadelphia, so that didn't make it any better. And he's sitting out in the stands. At the end of the 1930 season, the Phillies have fallen back into the cellar. They're not very good. Cubs come to town. They're in first place. And O'Doul is actually sidelined with shin splints. Uh, but he had five straight uh, successful pinch hits against the uh, Cubs in that series. Hit two home runs that won games, the second a walk-off home run. And what had happened in that last game was uh, a pitcher had, was on first base, he got picked off. And the guy came back to the bench and like said, no matter kid, I'll take care of it. Someone in the press box said, picking that guy off has just lost the game for the Cubs because O'Doul's gonna hit a home run. O'Doul was gonna bunt the guy over. And sure enough, lefty hits a home run, walk-off home run, and as he's uh, running around past the Cubs dugout, he's screaming at McCarthy, there goes your gold. Cubs left town in third place, didn't win the pennant. Wrigley was sitting in the outfield with all the fans telling him, uh, you, you know, your player just beat you, you should have kept him, and, and uh, this will save you from uh, being beaten by the athletics again in the World Series and all this. And McCarthy was fired two weeks later and ended up uh, going to the Yankees. And also in that 1929 season, uh, again, uh, McGraw had always said that lefty couldn't hit left-handers. He tattooed Carl Hubble all season long and took particular del delight and, and uh, talked to a reporter afterwards. You know, and people think you can't hit left-handers. I never got a chance to hit them. Now I did. I hit left-handers, and he sure did. And it was at that time that he became the man in the green suit and started getting some uh, endorsements. Um, you can see he had a, his own line of baseball shoes in Philadelphia and looking rather dapper in his uh, uh, golf outing uniform. He's on the cover of baseball magazine and he really was an incredibly popular player. Um, he was a person who really loved people. He was energized by people and people took to him. Uh, Charlie Graham, who's owner of the Seals, said you never wanted to walk down the street with Lefty O'Doul because it was a really a series of interruptions. It wasn't really a walk, because everybody wanted to talk to him. Everybody knew him. He knew everybody. Um, the book opens with uh, him in 1958. He's 61 years old. And some Japanese businessmen happened to be coming to San Francisco and see him and hail him from across the street and run over and talk to him. Um, he was just, uh, he had charisma. He was uh, uh, an excellent ball player, and again, related to people really well. But the Phillies were not very good. They needed pitching. Lefty was the only regular player they had who was over 30 years of age. So they traded him to the Brooklyn Dodgers, and there he would win his second batting title um, at the age of 35, uh, hitting 368 for Brooklyn in 1932. Um, on the top right, he's pictured with Johnny Frederick and uh, Hack Wilson. And then on the bottom, that's a photo that actually hung over Lefty's bar for uh, many years, uh, in, the, in the bar over the bar. And it's a picture, it's a field day competition. At the end of the year, the Yankees, Dodgers, and Giants would play kind of a round robin series. And then they have series of field events. And Lefty here, he's 34 years old and he's just broken Jim Thorpe's record for fastest man from home plate to first base. So he's a tremendous natural athlete. Then he went back to uh, the Giants. He had kind of a slump-ridden start to his 1933 season. He went 0 for 29, one of the few slumps he ever had. And actually, when he broke the slump, um, he got down on his knees and kissed first base. Lefty was always, if nothing, a showman. 
Uh, and he was voted into the first National League All-Star team in 1933. There was actually a fan vote. He finished third in the voting. He didn't end up starting. He came off the bench and did pinch hit. And then one of his proudest moments, he got to play in the World Series in 1933. And the picture of him catching the ball on the right is during the 1933 World Series or, or uh, leading up to it. And it kind of reminds me of a famous story that Lefty told. Lefty admitted he was not a, as much as he was a scientific hitter, he used film, he took uh, notes on every pitcher he faced. He would get pitchers out there if they're like the next guy coming in. Uh, he would try to find somebody like that to, to pitch against him. Any advantage he could get. But at the same time, he never really worked on his fielding much and was one of the people who was honest about that. And there's a famous story. Uh, what actually happened at least twice, once in San Francisco and once in New York, is that someone posing as lefty went to a bar and uh, was passing bad checks, basically. Uh, and so Lefty heard about it, and then his story goes that he went to the bar, and after the guy admitted he didn't know him, he said, um, well, here's $20, cover the bill, don't worry about it, and said, I'll give you a piece of advice. Next time someone comes in here claiming to be me, take him out back, throw him a baseball. If he catches it, it's not me. Now, it's an exaggeration because you can see here's one where Lefty did catch a ball, so we know he can catch one. But the, he retired after the 1934 season and began his long career with the San Francisco Seals, and here he is with Charlie Graham in the suit, and then on the left is Dom DiMaggio, and the right is Brooks Holder, who was a longtime outfielder for the San Francisco Seals. And this was the relationship that was really important to Lefty, and I think uh, up till 1948 when Charlie Graham died. Charlie Graham had always wanted Lefty to come back uh, to San Francisco once his major league career as he had an open, um, open offer to come back and manage the Seals. And after his first contract ended, every subsequent contract was a handshake. They never had a piece of paper. And Lefty, by the 1940s, was one of the highest paid managers in all of baseball, not just the minor leagues. He was making nearly 50000 a year uh, with the San Francisco Seals, and he had a percentage of the gate, and he and uh, Charlie Graham really got along well. Uh, unfortunately, after Charlie died, Paul Fagan, the next owner, and Lefty had a very difficult relationship, and Fagan ended up firing Lefty, and Lefty kind of lost, uh, although he kept managing. He wasn't quite the same after that. Uh, Bob Stevens felt he never really recovered from uh, Charlie Graham's death and being fired by Paul Fagan. But he had, a, he had a tremendous success with the Seals, usually sent up one or two players to the major leagues every year. And you have to understand the Pacific Coast League, it's not like today. It wasn't just a farm system for the major leagues. The Pacific Coast League signed their own players. So Joe DiMaggio signed with the San Francisco Seals, not a major league team. Ted Williams, as I mentioned before, signed with the Padres. Ferris Fain signed with the Seals. And this was part of what kept the doors open uh, during the Depression, especially for the Seals, and Lefty's ability to develop talent, uh, which he was known for. In fact, other, other teams would send players to him. Connie Mack would send players to him to work out during spring training. And there would be players that would come to him for advice, and they would work out with the Seals during spring training. But Lefty's biggest legacy is Japan, and I, so I want to end the segment talking uh, a bit about his role in Japan. And the first time that he went over was in 1931. And this is him on the left. He's uh, wearing the uniform of the uh, All-American uh, All-Stars. It was a tremendous team. May have been the best of the teams that went over. Had Lou Gehrig, Lefty Grove, Frankie Frisch, just a tremendous group of players. Uh, and this is uh, them post. So in 1931, he went over. Unfortunately, the team uh, didn't behave very well. There was even an incident that Fred Lieb, the sports writer, wrote about where um, they were in the Japanese prime minister's residence and he left for a call and some of them were pocketing souvenirs out of, uh, <laughs> out of, out of the uh, office there. Um, and so, but Lefty, uh, he had 6.15 during that trip. Uh, also won a golf tournament uh, among the players and was given a couple of awards for that. And, and really, he was sidelined by injury in the middle of the tour. And really, uh, I think that gave him the time to really get to know the Japanese. And Lefty, he dropped out of school in the eighth grade, but he was a tremendous self-educator. He loved to learn, and he loved different cultures, and he really took to the Japanese culture. And I think their, their um, ability to be coached and want to learn 
um, and their desire to always improve. And I think he really related to that. And so he went back the next year in 1932, and this is him. Uh, these are the same four men in the two pictures. They're just in different order, but in the top left, there's Herb Hunter along with Lefty, and then Ted Lyons, the White Sox player, and then Mo Berg, the catcher, um, who a lot of people know as the spy who played baseball. And they went over and coached college players during 1932. Lefty was anxious to get back there and reaffirm ties. And so um, Lefty taught hitting, Ted Lyons taught pitching, Mo Berg taught catching, and uh, Herb Hunter was kind of the guy who was uh, organizing the, the tour. He was a former teammate of lefties and had uh, led tours in Japan during the 1920s. But this led Lefty, he uh, started making contact with a man named Satoru Suzuki who had come over from Japan to New York and they had met when Lefty was on the Giants. And Suzuki had returned to Japan uh, and enlisted a newspaper publisher named Matsutaro Shiriki uh, who owned the Yomiuri paper and um, they started talking about organizing baseball and trying to bring Babe Ruth over. And Lefty knew they wanted that. And Lefty was a good friend of, of, of Babe Ruth. So he suggested I got to see the original correspondence, uh, a copy of the original correspondence between them where, where Lefty actually suggested, how about let's bring Babe Ruth over. And it was very important to the Japanese. Babe Ruth was the biggest name in baseball. They wanted to see him before he retired. And uh, so in 1934, Lefty brought finally brought Babe Ruth to Japan. And this is, uh, you know, the team is on the left. The, bo the very bottom left is Lefty with Satoru Suzuki. On the right, you already see that Lefty Odul is called a baseball ambassador, that he was already known for speaking Japanese. He couldn't play in that series because the National League, he was a National Leaguer, and the National League withdrew permission of their players to play uh, in Japan. Some of them were concerned about strange oriental diseases that could happen. The other thing you have to realize is it took a couple of weeks to get to Japan. There weren't airlines and things like that at that time. You took a pretty arduous uh, boat across the Pacific Ocean. And uh, it was a faraway place. There wasn't that connectedness where people knew what they were gonna expect. In fact, the players were very surprised how modern Japan was. And that tour was extremely successful. And on, in the bottom center, there's a, a picture with Lefty with several Japanese players. And he, at the end of the 1934 tour, where Babe Ruth was mobbed by probably a good million people, um, Lefty uh, stayed behind afterwards and helped found the Tokyo Giants, which is now the Yomiuri Giants. The Japanese had never had professional baseball. They'd pretty much stuck with amateur baseball and felt that was kind of the purity of amateurism, and college baseball was the big thing, and still is today, the big six college teams. And that's what Lefty had gone over and coached them in 1932. But he tried planting the seeds of professional baseball, and finally in 1935, the Tokyo Giants were formed, and they came over, he enabled them, uh, helped uh, organize a tour where they came over in 1935 and had an extremely successful tour uh, there, and came again in 1936. And, uh, but, and he kept going over until about 1938 when uh, hostilities became too much uh, as he kept trying to promote the game and be a part of it. And, and so finally he couldn't go over anymore and he, was, uh, he almost felt like Pearl Harbor as a betrayal and it was a tough time. It was a uh, tough time for everybody and he, he had people he knew that went into internment camps, Capi Harada's family, uh, Capi Harada, who I'll talk about in a second, um, had his, it was a, a California-born uh, Japanese American, uh, and he was the one who convinced Lefty to come over to Japan after the war. And um, you know, his family was in the internment camp during the war, and it, it was a tough time. So Lefty tried to get back to Japan. He was uh, almost immediately after the surrender. He was he was there. Um, right after the war, uh, one reporter was there and, and the uh, Japanese prime minister uh, asked about Lefty and said he really should have been a diplomat instead of a ball player. 
um, another uh, Emperor Hirohito's brother had come and asked, how, how's Lefty doing? That was the first question that he had. So Lefty was, remained popular, and he was kind of surprised how popular he remained. He tried to get back there in 47 and 48, but uh, to no avail. But in 1949, General Douglas MacArthur, who was essentially running Japan, was uh, running into concerns about the country, that it was falling, uh, the morale was bad, and the communists were starting to make inroads. And sports was something they tried to revive, and it was Capi Harada, who was an aide-de-camp to uh, another general who had been given the task of reviving sports in Japan, who suggested a baseball goodwill tour, like it happened with, uh, in 1931 and 1934, try to help morale. And MacArthur thought that was a great idea and asked who it should be. And he said, how about Lefty Odul? And said, go get him. So Lefty came. And in 1949, people, he discovered people remembered him. By some accounts, there were nearly a million people lining the streets of Tokyo when he first arrived. And when he got to General MacArthur's residence, uh, MacArthur said, you are home. And these are pictures from the first games. The picture on the left and the bottom right are from the first game, and that bottom right is the first time that the Japanese and American flags had flown together at the same time since the war. It was a tremendously important moment. And there were different baseball cards and baseball card holders and programs uh, uh, during this tour. And I was able to see uh, about 300 pages of Japanese newspaper articles that had been translated to English and to understand the impact that he had that was beyond baseball. It was, there's a really touching story about how one Japanese newspaper editor said she was moved to tears looking at how he treated orphans, that they'd moved the GIs out of the select seats and he'd put the orphans there. Most of the money that they earned from this went to orphanages and to sports programs for youth in Japan. The uh, president of the Tokyo Board of Education wrote, uh, an, a letter to Lefty saying what it meant to the future of the kids of that country that he'd come. And he didn't, you know, it wasn't just baseball. He didn't ignore them as people. There was a riot that he actually quelled when some people couldn't get in and see him. He came out and made sure he talked to them. He understood the culture and understood the respect uh, that they, uh, he felt they deserved. During that tour, he was able to meet uh, the emperor's uh, son, who's the current emperor of Japan. Um, that picture where he's shaking hands. And they played no matter what the weather was. Um, you can see they were playing in, in pouring rain. Lefty said, well, seals are known to be able to be out in wet weather. We should do well. Um, the little ribbon, that was given to each player to identify them. Uh, so when they were out in the community, the Japanese people would know which player that was. And they actually had taxis uh, each player uh, had a taxi assigned to him with their uniform number on the top, and those people were there 24-7 to take them wherever they wanted to go. They played before as much as 90,000 people in a couple of the games, and played, uh, they played 10 games before Lefty staged a, another for free kids' day, uh, and played before 500,000 people in, that, in those 10 games. This is in the Japanese Hall of Fame. This is the uniform. Uh, hat and bat that he used uh, in Japan, and he actually did play. He was 52 years old, but he still swung a bat, and that's Lefty pinch hitting there in Japan. Swing still looks pretty good. Lefty's adage was, don't overstride, keep your eye on the ball to the bat, look for a fast ball, because you can always adjust to the curve. But then half of his philosophy had to do with confidence. He always talked about it being like swinging an ax at a tree. You're not afraid of what the tree will do to you, so you stand up there, you gotta have that same confidence and getting into that mental thing. And that's where a lot of his superstitions came in. It was as much to get him in the mental uh, state. And he did pretty well. He hit 349 lifetime in the major leagues, fourth all time. He, uh, I was reading not too long ago that he's one of 14 players in major league history who at 300 at batting average of 400 on base percentage and a 500 slugging percentage, both home and away in the, in the major leagues. And his minor league numbers were almost exactly the same. I think he had six more hits in the minor leagues and about nine less at bats. Very consistent. He then did other tours. He didn't forget Japan. It wasn't a one-off. So in 1950, he went back. And this time, he didn't want to bring a full team. He asked to bring Joe DiMaggio. 
So uh, on the upper left, they're actually visiting Korea as during the Korean War. And you see Lefty actually has uh, the uh, traditional hat. Joe's not doing it, but Lefty's right in there uh, wearing the Korean hat. On the right at the top, they're working with youth, youth baseball players. On the bottom left, you can get a sense of some of the crowds that they saw. This is them greeting the crowds upon their arrival. Uh, and on the bottom right, of course, is uh, Lefty and Joe with Douglas MacArthur. He came back uh, in 1951, spring training. Coming out of that 1950 tour, he actually invited uh, what he considered the four top Japanese players uh, to come to spring training in Modesto, California. And here he is with them, and all five of these players are in the Japanese Baseball Hall of Fame, or all five people in this picture, including Lefty. In 1951, he brought another all-star team to Japan. This was the first major league level all-star team since the Babe Ruth Tour in 1934. And you can see some of the people at the bottom row. You see Dom DiMaggio and Billy Martin. Uh, Bobby Shantz is the second from the right on the bottom. Mel Parnell on the far right. Dino Rostelli on the far left with Ferris Fane next to him. Um, it was a, a really good ball club and a, another very successful tour. Uh, and straight above Lefty's head is the Emperor's brother, the one who had asked uh, about Lefty uh, right after the war. And he was right there in the front row to see Lefty play. Lefty did get to meet the Emperor in 1949, too. At the end of that tour, um, they went to a, a, he greeted them and, and talked about uh, how he was gratified to meet the greatest manager ever, which left, he said, I, I, I'm glad he didn't know I finished in seventh place this year. And, uh, but, and the emperor again thanked him for his efforts in Japan. He continued to go to Japan uh, over the years. 1954, um, this is a picture actually in a uh, stopover in Honolulu, and it's a famous photo, but it really tells a lot. Joe and Marilyn were only married for 10 months, and the tension really came out of this 1954 tour. Lefty was one of six, he and his wife were two of the six people at, at Joe's wedding to Marilyn in San Francisco in January of 1954. And uh, Lefty then went and uh, won his second Pro -Am, Crosby Pro-Am, uh, and then they met back up and basically w Joe and Marilyn spent their honeymoon in Japan and Korea. Lefty's wife and Marilyn went to Korea to entertain the troops while uh, Lefty and Joe uh, uh, coached hitters in, back in Japan. But you can see the tension's already there. It's just interesting to me, there's Marilyn, she knows where that camera is, eating it up. Uh, Joe looks a little irritated and Lefty's kind of, well, what am I doing in the middle of this? <laughs> And it was, a, it was a tour that had a lot of the, there was a lot of tension and the Japanese attention to her and uh, there were some issues there that, uh, of course, they were divorced by the end of the year. On the bottom right, another trip that, made, that Lefty made was in 1960 when he took the San Francisco Giants over to Japan. And here he's meeting with Kapi Harada on the left and Matsutaro Shiriki, the newspaper editor who had helped, uh, worked with Lefty to bring Babe Ruth to Japan back in 1934. Um, Lefty is not sitting in the traditional Japanese way, and the reason is not a lack of respect or anything. He popped his Achilles tendon trying to show off how fast he could get to first base in a charity softball game. Uh, and at 63, that maybe wasn't the smartest thing to do. And then in 2002, Lefty was, uh, was recognized by the Japanese for his efforts in Japan by being inducted into the Japanese Baseball Hall of Fame. And here's a picture that also includes Tom uh, with the, a cake of chrysanthemums, I think is what that was uh, made of. Uh, and uh, that was a, 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 an event held at Lefty O'Doul's to celebrate his being inducted in the Hall of Fame. On the right is uh, the plaque at the Hall of Fame and it talks about his uh, contributions to starting Japanese baseball, the 1934 tour, the 49 tour, the 1960 tour with San Francisco, and he was uh, inducted as a full member of the Hall of Fame as a, as a major contributor to Japanese baseball. And on the left, uh, at the bottom, is his uh, tombstone where he talks about uh, Lefty O'Doul, the man in the green suit. It has his statistics and talks about um, he, was a, he was here at a good time and had a good time while he was here. And that really tells you about Lefty and what he's done for the globalization of the game. And, 
you know, is such a fascinating character, only really touched on some of the stories that are in the book and some of his accomplishments. Um, a tremendously accomplished individual, a great ball player, um, and a great influence on the game, and I think a person whose legacy is only now being felt um, in the last 15, 20 years with the influx of uh, Asian ball players, not just from Japan, but Korea and Taiwan, et cetera, and uh, the real globalization of the sport, which he played a major role in starting that. So with that, that's Lefty, and if you have any questions, happy to answer.